All right, let's talk a little bit about perhaps the most prominent person outside of Christ in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Paul, we ought to look at him uh, because he is the major writer of the New Testament. Um, almost half the New Testament is contributed by the Apostle Paul. We have the story in the book of Acts of his pretty remarkable conversion experience. And we think about uh, nobody changes like Paul changes when he goes from being a terrorist, goes from persecuting the church to being its strongest advocate. His missionary zeal, when he chooses to follow Christ and when he chooses to become the apostle to the Gentiles, his missionary zeal is very single-minded. Uh, he wishes to go to regions beyond, uh, places that other people have not been, so that he doesn't build on another's, another man's foundation. But he is looking in every way to get the gospel to the world. Paul is also the major interpreter of the cross. We have the events of the cross, and we have Jesus' statements about what is coming in the gospels. But it's Paul who gives us a lot of what was happening there in terms of our sin, in terms of Christ taking our sin upon, a, upon himself, uh, his resurrection being the first fruits of our own resurrection, all that sort of thing uh, comes as Paul begins to unpack for us of what Christ did. And then Paul is the one who gives us a structure for the church. In the pastoral epistles, we find out requirements for deacons, for elders. We find out uh, the responsibilities of the church. And so Paul is the one who gives us those initial clues to the structure. So let's take a look a little bit at his life. His early life, he spent being trained as a Pharisee. Um, he grew up in Tarsus. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which means he had the best training as a Pharisee. Um, and so that's going to come into play when he becomes a follower of Christ to all of that training has to be retooled, um, not forgotten because the training of, in the Old Testament is good training. Uh, but to see it in light of Christ is a whole additional thing. Uh, so Paul has great training, and he has a single-minded zeal, as we'll see after his conversion, uh, before he is moving against churches, carrying warrants uh, for the arrest of any believers that he might find. He is there holding the coats of people stoning Stephen and uh, giving his consent to that. So Paul is an early uh, terrorist to the early church until that day when he is moving toward Damascus to continue those tasks. And uh, Christ meets him on the road and everything changes for him. You can read about that in uh, Acts. Right after his conversion, uh, Paul spends time, as I said, almost 14 years retooling uh, what he has learned, uh, sitting at the feet of Jesus this time, and learning and growing in such a way that when he reappears on the scene uh, at the beginning of the first missionary journey, uh, he is a well-trained, uh, single-minded devotee of Jesus Christ, and nothing's going to stop him. Another thing that has happened in the early church is one of the, one of the significant churches, the significant church in terms of Gentile evangelism, is the church at Syrian Antioch. Um, this church is the place that it's said that Jesus, that the disciples were first called Christians little Christs, people who shared in the character of Christ. We were first called Christians at Antioch. And it is Antioch that decides to send out to separate Paul and Barnabas from ministry to the Gentiles. And so the first missionary journey begins right out of the church at Syrian Antioch. They don't get very far before uh, John Mark, uh, who has volunteered to go along with him, uh, 
defects, uh, whether from weariness, whether from homesickness, whether from questions about uh, this Gentile. We're not told what the issue would be, but we do know that John Mark goes back and Paul and Barnabas go on. Uh, the first city they go to is Pisidian Antioch, not to be confused with Syrian Antioch, just two towns with the same name. And uh, in that place, they have a Jewish audience, and uh, Paul preaches a typically Jewish message, just like Stephen, starting at the beginning of Jewish history, picking out a few significant events and then making a beeline for the cross. Uh, the Gentiles begin to be interested as well, and it seems like the whole city comes out the next Sunday to hear Paul speak and uh, riot and uh, un unrest comes and Paul and Barnabas leave and it says they kick off the dust and they move on to the next town. The kicking off the dust is that prophetic emblematic action that uh, Jesus suggested to his disciples when he first sent them out uh, to the towns in Judah, uh, kick off the dust if they don't hear the message. And so they would move on. Paul and Barnabas here would move on to Iconium. And in Iconium, um, they remain for a long time. They bear witness to the word of grace uh, but the people are divided, some for the Jews, some for the Gentiles, and uh, they get together and they're getting ready to stone Paul and Barnabas. And so when they learn of it, they flee on and they move on to Lystra and Derbe. It is in uh, Lystra that Paul and Barnabas are confused with Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, because uh, they are trying to be syncretistic, trying to understand the power of this new message in light of their old culture. And so Paul and Barnabas pull their hair out, well, if they had hair, uh, pull their hair out and uh, begin to describe who they are. And then there is, again, conflict. And they head out from Lystra then to Derby. And in Derby, they make many disciples. They strengthen the souls of the disciples. And uh, then leave and head back. It is at Lystra, by the way, that uh, Paul is stoned and left for dead. Uh, but even that doesn't stop the Apostle Paul. The next event that we have in Paul's life is a move toward the Jerusalem Council. Uh, this was once Paul and Barnabas are being effective and they come and tell stories of the Gentiles coming to know Christ and choosing to follow the Jewish Messiah. Uh, they, the church is both encouraged, delighted at what's happening, but then also beginning to wonder about the theological question, how do they fit into the old covenant community? In other words, should they be circumcised? Uh, should they be held to all of the the issues that that Jewish people would be? And uh, Peter stands up in that council and begins to share um, the acceptance of of Gentiles and his point. Uh, and then James, oddly enough, it is James then that says, "So this is this then is what we should do." And James lays out for them that we will not hold them to to the usual Jewish practices. Uh, we will ask them to abstain from food sacrificed to idols. And uh, otherwise, large measure, they are free. And uh, that letter was produced so that wherever Paul and Barnabas go, wherever Gentiles are coming to hear the gospel, they might know what the the decision is of the church with regard to how well they will fit in with the uh, the church at Jerusalem and with the Jewish people who are also now a part of the body of Christ. So that's the Jewish council, Jerusalem council. We'll move on to the second missionary journey then. There's a conflict right up front because Barnabas is ready to go get John Mark and head out again. And Paul goes, we can't take John Mark. Uh, he defected. 
And so, uh, seems to me Barnabas is looking out for the man, and Paul is looking out for the ministry. Those are both worthwhile uh, ends, uh, but there is conflict, and Barnabas and John Mark leave, and uh, Barnabas is vindicated by the fact that John Mark is uh, rescued. He is he is put forward, and eventually we will get the Gospel of Mark because of Barnabas' intervention in that young man's life. On the other hand, we will have Paul and Silas set out for a fruitful expansion of the gospel cause, and they will take, instead of John Mark, they will take a young Timothy along with them, and uh, that is going to be profitable as well. So even this personality conflict, this issue at the beginning of the second missionary journey turns into something good on both sides as a result of that conflict. They, Paul and Silas, along with Timothy, set out again, and it seems as if Paul is wanting to go west with the gospel, uh, but, I'm sorry, wanting to go east with the gospel, and at every point it seems like the Holy Spirit is hindering them, and so they find themselves at Troas, and Paul has a dream of a man in Macedonian, in Greek garb, um, saying, come over here and help us. And so Paul and Silas, uh, in what is probably the most significant event in church history with regard, and perhaps in world history, with regard to Western civilization and Western culture, because that Macedonian call means Paul and Silas and Timothy will move into Europe. And the first place they go is Philippi. And you can see the other cities uh, that they travel. Here is our introduction to Thessalonica. Here is our introduction to Berea. Uh, in Berea, they made sure that what Paul was saying was true um, by comparing it with Scripture. And so we're told that the Bereans were even more noble than the Thessalonians because of their double-checking even Paul to make sure that what Paul is teaching is true. We have Paul on Mars Hill in Athens. Uh, we have Paul's first contact with Corinth. And then the second missionary journey ends again with Paul going to Antioch in Syria and uh, reporting for that missionary sending body uh, what the success was of that second missionary journey. As Paul is heading back, there are some places that Paul visits, Ephesus, Macedonia, Greece, and Jerusalem. And it is in Jerusalem, all along the way toward Jerusalem, he is warned that uh, trials and arrest await him. And he travels to Jerusalem. He is arrested by the Roman tribune. And uh, when issues come where they are going where uh, some of the Jews are plotting to kill Paul on a pretense. Uh, Felix, uh, the Roman tribune, writes a note and sends Paul to Felix in Caesarea for sorting out the issue and telling the Roman tribune in Jerusalem what to do. So Paul is smuggled out and taken to Caesarea, uh, he sits there for two years because Felix waits for a bribe and because he wants to please the Jews, he leaves Paul in jail. And then Felix is replaced by Festus, and uh, Festus hears Paul's testimony. And in the process of that testimony, Paul appeals to Caesar, which means he wants his case judged by Caesar. Um, Agrippa and Bernice happen to be in town, and so Festus has Paul appear before Agrippa and Bernice because Agrippa would know the law, know Jewish um, background better than Festus would. And so Agrippa and Bernice come to listen, and it is said that Paul could have been freed had he not appealed to Caesar. But of course, this is all in God's plan. Paul uh, claims his citizenship, 
Uh, they ship him off to Rome. There is a shipwreck, and the book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome waiting for a trial, which means that's as far as the history has gone. Now, Luke can't write anymore because he doesn't know yet how things are going to turn out. So there we are. There's Paul's life as we know it in a nutshell. Um, it's interesting to look at the character of Paul, uh, some of the things that come out in his life, his his loyalty to Christ, uh, his humility, especially like in books like Second Corinthians, where Paul is having to defend himself. Uh, but the way he way he does it, he's he's really reticent to tell you his his resume of accomplishments. Uh, Paul's Paul's conviction, Paul's hope for the future. Um, especially comes out in Second Timothy, where his time of departure he believes at hand is at hand, uh, but he knows that uh, his death will not be the end. Um, Paul's love for people for churches like the the church at Philippi uh, comes through. Uh, he is a man of prayer. And one thing we don't usually think of, but we sure see it in the book of Philippians, is Paul is a man of joy. Uh, as much as he is single-minded in his focus, uh, the joy of serving Christ, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, is uh, a great theme in Paul's life. So I hope that at least introduces you to Paul a little bit. Uh, you'll meet him in his books along the way, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, you'll meet him in the book of Acts as he begins to move towards center stage uh, throughout the second half, let's say, of the book of Acts. So thanks for hanging out. We'll talk to you again soon.